say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. <laughs> so we're in the season of Epiphany. Uh, maybe you've had a personal epiphany, uh, an aha moment in your life when something that was there all along is suddenly revealed. And there are lots of different kinds of epiphanies. Uh, I, we've been just today, we started in the adult class going over some things that, you know, why do we do this? Why do we say that? And I imagine that for some people there was an epiphany about, you know, why we do certain things. I mean, for example, the incense that we're using today, you know, we don't use it all the time, but why do we use it? Well, here's the uh, epiphany. It's not so much aha, but back in the Middle Ages, when bathing wasn't quite so common, <laughs> it covered a world of sin. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that, that's the, the real purpose, the original purpose for incense. And like everything else in the church, it, it took on, uh, as time went on, it took on more spiritual meaning. And I think the way to look at it today is uh, if you've ever seen any of the, say, Mission Impossible shows or something else where, you know, someone's trying to get into a room with lasers going across the floor and they spray you know, that mist so they can see, well, the way to think about incense is it reveals our prayers. It reveals something about our prayers that's there all the time. You can't see it necessarily, but the, the incense reveals it for us, our prayers rising up to God. And, and those are, you know, maybe little epiphanies. You're like, oh, I didn't know that before. So it's a little aha moment. When I read the gospel earlier this week, for the first time ever, I hooked on to the voice from the cloud, you know, saying, this is my son, the beloved, and my first thought was, oh, so it's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, the voice behind the curtain, and who is this guy? Who is this God? Who is this voice from out of nowhere? And really, one way to think about this particular season in the church year and the things that we're going to be reading in the Gospels is that Jesus reveals to us this God who, at the moment, is just a voice from, from heaven. A, a voice, a, a God who, in the Old Testament, and even in some cases in the New Testament, is uh, the description of our relationship with, God, with this God, one of the words used in that description is the word fear. Now, there's certainly reason at times to be fearful of God. I mean, he is the creator of the universe. He's all-powerful. Uh, Moses was fearful when, when God showed up. Isaiah was fearful when he had his vision of himself in the, in the temple in the Holy of Holies. But the, the, the thing about the fear of God is it's more like incredible awe in, the, in, the in encountering transcendence. But here's the thing. That isn't the only thing to know about God. And what Jesus does is embody this disembodied voice from heaven and shows us this God to be a personal God. A God who in Matthew, and when Jesus teaches his disciples to pray, what does he say? Pray like this, our Father. You can know a father. You can have a relationship with a father. You can't have a relationship with a power, a force. You can't have a relationship with electricity. And if that's all God is, is, is power or a force, then he's going to remain distant and aloof. But the thing about the language, our language today, is when we call God Father, that may not necessarily be helpful to everyone particularly if you had a neglectful father or an abusive father, that phrase may not be helpful. I think it's noteworthy, to say the least, that what Jesus taught us was our Father in heaven. 
be that as it may, misunderstanding and misconceptions about God develop when our concept of him, whether it's our concept of him as father or just God in general, gets skewed in some way. I mean, a lot of people, their conception of God is that God is unreasonable. This is a God who just demands things from us. It's God who creates rules. I don't want to worship a God who demands my worship. Some people think that that's what God does. He demands our worship. People can get a perception of God as unreliable. I mean, it's a natural, normal, human, even for Christians, natural, normal human reaction when tragedy strikes, when you're hurt, to say, why, God? How could you let this happen, God? You let me down, God. And we can develop a perception of God as unreliable or unconcerned. God's too busy for me. I can't tell you the number of times that people have said to me, oh, God's got bigger problems than little old me to deal with. Wrong. God has, if you will, nothing better to do than to hear you because that's why he created you. Or maybe God is unpleasable. Any of these misconceptions are the things that people can develop over time, attitudes about God, ideas about God, that don't jive with the God who's revealed by Jesus. So who is this God? Who is this Father in heaven that Jesus is going to be revealing? What kind of Father is he? Well, I think first of all, he's an approachable Father. Very much approachable. And you know, here's the thing about approachable people. Approachable people are the people who care about you. When you know that someone cares about you, you know you can go to that person with anything. And God wants you to know that he cares about you. He's compassionate, loving, and gracious. In the book of Hebrews chapter four, verses 15 and 16, we read this high priest of ours, and this is, refers to Jesus. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same tests that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us boldly, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You know how at the end of the Eucharistic prayer, I say, and now we boldly say, our Father. You know why we say boldly? Isn't that kind of that word ever leap out at you? Why do we say boldly? Because of this. Because of what Jesus has done, we can boldly enter the throne room. Because of who Jesus is, we can boldly call him Father, which when Jesus first taught it in the Aramaic, of course, was Daddy. We can call God Daddy, and boldly so. Big difference from a fearful God who you have to be in complete and total utter awe of all the time. He's an approachable father. He cares about us. There's a story in the Gospels that the disciples and Jesus are on a boat in the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is asleep and a storm hits and the boat's nearly swamped and the disciples, they, they go and wake up Jesus and they're like, Lord, don't you even care that we're about to perish? You know, that's a good question. Does God care about my problems? Yes. Peter wrote in his first epistle, give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. And he didn't give any qualifications to that. He didn't say just your spiritual cares and worries. So does God care about your house payment, your car payment? Yes. Does God care about the fact that your kid, need, kid needs braces? Yes. Does God care about your marriage? Yes. Does God care about your relationships? Yes, 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 yes. Anything you can think of, God cares about it, all of it. So God is an approachable God. He is also an accessible God. That means he's available all the time. He's not distant. As I said last week, God wants to be found. In my own walk with the Lord, uh, I've discovered several things about the accessibility of God. He's, he's, first of all, he's never too busy for me. In fact, the more I've grown in my relationship with God, I've discovered that it's usually the opposite. He's never too busy for me, but somehow I can get too busy for him. 
And when that happens, Jesus has a way of nudging me or hitting me upside the head some way. Don't you think you ought to be praying about that, Ben? Don't, don't you think it's a good time to come to me with that? He's not the one who doesn't have time. It's me getting all caught up in my own life, in my own situation. I've learned that God cares enough to meet my needs. And I've learned this particularly over the years in my own giving, particularly when it's been very difficult, where, you know, for whatever financial reason, it was fearful to keep giving the way I was. And I discovered that I kept giving and my needs were always met. I never had to worry about my needs. God is sympathetic also to my hurts. Uh, I, and I've learned that the way God works through his people, uh, Christians in my life. Psalm 34, 17 and 18 says, the Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. And like I said, the, one of the ways that he does that is through other Christians. So Jesus showed us that God is approachable and accessible, and he's taught us this by this language of Abba, our Abba, our Daddy in heaven. Now, I suspect that none of you call God Daddy, even in your private prayers. It probably feels awkward. You don't have that kind of relationship with God. And it, not that I call God Daddy, but I try to remind myself that that's the kind of relationship that he wants to have with me. Uh, Nick was telling me uh, last week, he was at the youth group, and one or more of the kids in the youth group referred to me as Father Ben. And Nick's like, who's that? <laughs> because I'm dad. I'm not Father Ben, I'm dad. And God is not your father in, in the sense of the, the, the distant God who doesn't care about you or want to know about you. He's your dad. He's your papa. Whatever informal language you use for your own family, you know, mother or father, that's the relationship that God wants to have with you. He's approachable, he's accessible, and finally, he's able. He is an able father. Jesus said, for nothing is impossible with God. The late author Dallas Willard, as I think I've said before, he put it this way, God is very, very smart. Which, yeah, that, that kind of sums it up. Nothing is beyond his ability. And this is in contrast to earthly fathers. You know, when you're growing up, I know when I was growing up, I thought my dad could do anything. And then I grew up. <laughs> and, and realized that my dad didn't have unlimited resources and he doesn't have unlimited wisdom. I don't, I don't know if you've heard the one about the, the two school kids, the school boys arguing at school, and one kid says, my dad can beat up your dad, and the other kid says, oh, that's nothing, so can my mom. <laughs> so you, you grow up and you realize that your, your parents have limits, but your father in heaven has no limits. Paul wrote it, put it this way in Ephesians, all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. So, you know, what have you been doubting that God can handle? What's that situation in your life this week where you're like, oh, I gotta deal with this myself? And, you know, ask yourself, do I, am I really saying that I'm gonna handle something that I think God can't handle? Is there anything that God can't deal with? You need to be giving those things to him, putting those on his lap. Now, having said all that, there's a question that comes to my mind about the whole concept of God as Father. And the question is, is God a Father to everyone? Christian, non-Christian, everyone. And the answer to that is, well, we need to define a little bit more what we mean by Father. 
If by father we mean in the sense that he's the creator, well, yeah. If we mean that God loves everyone he's created, absolutely. That God has a plan and purpose for everyone on the planet, yes. In all of those senses, God is a father to everyone. But there's more to being a father, it seems to me, than being born. There's, it's, a, it's a relationship. You can be born into the human family, but God invites us to belong to his family. And the, the New Testament has language to distinguish between the, these two, if you will, concepts of God as father, God the father of, of all humankind, God the father of, of all creation, versus Daddy, Abba, the, the father that we have a relationship with through Jesus Christ. And the language that's used in the New Testament is the language of being born again. That's what Jesus says to Nicodemus in the Gospel of John, you must be born again, born from above. And what does that mean? Well, Paul unpacks it for us. In Galatians, he wrote, you are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So you're physically born into the human family, into the human race. To be adopted into God's family, you, you need to be reborn, spiritually born again. Paul put it this way in another of his letters in Ephesians chapter one. This is the message version. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wanted us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. So God is the father of all, but he's daddy to all those who come to him and come to belief in his son, Jesus Christ. There is this special relationship that God calls us to through his son. And I hope that that's an epiphany for you, that God in Jesus Christ has been revealed as approachable. He is a God who cares deeply about you. He's accessible. There isn't anything you can't come to God with. You can come to him at any time and come to him boldly. And of course, God is able. He's able in his infinite power and wisdom to do more than we can ask or imagine. Amen. Amen.